Hello and welcome to Crew Call, everybody. Today's guest is Jason Roberts, a line producer with over three decades of experience. He's worked on everything from Seinfeld to the Orville and many, many shows in between. Welcome, Jason Roberts. How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm, uh, I'm good and I'm happy to be here. And I like that we have a very small, intimate group so that uh, it could maybe be a little more one-on-one -on -one in this instance, which is nice. Yeah, absolutely. So let's get started with that. Um, the most basic question, I guess, probably on everybody's mind. What is a line producer? Help me out. Okay. Well, there's many different kinds of producers. A line producer is the producer on a show that usually figures out the day-to-day -day budgeting of a show and figures out all the variables and how to solve them as you go along. Uh, so it's not... It, I find it to be a creative job myself and uh, in the work that I do because I'm a creative person. So even though predominantly it's considered... Uh, you know, more of the finance and logistics side of it. Uh, I always am able to, you know, draw my, you know, parallels with my creative side to be able to help solve those problems and answer questions. But the line producer is the day-to-day -day producer that facilitates that forward movement of, uh, of any show. Yeah. How do you find yourself creatively solving problems? How do you draw upon that creative side you've got? Well, I mean, so... When I, when I mean creative, uh, okay. When I mean creative, everybody has whatever level of their own, you know, ideas on, on something that appeals to them or, or, or markers that they of things they like or don't like. And when you're doing a show or, or in any part of your life where you're, um, focused on, you know, completing something, sometimes there's just the basic mechanics of it where you get from point A to point B and, and it can be a great journey or, uh, you know, a tough journey or whatever it is, uh, that gets you from that point A to point B, but the, the creative input that you put into it changes your perception of it. So if I'm doing a show, uh, you know, about like the Orville, for example, where it's in space and everything, I have my own predisposed ideas of what I like. I love star Wars. Uh, you know, I'm not as much of a Star Trek fan, but I enjoy it, you know, whatever it is. And so I've, I've, you know, in my past history, which I'm going to talk to you guys about in a little bit, you know, it's, it's informed my personal tastes. And so if we're doing a show and I see something that maybe, you know, we're trying to solve a problem and, you know, no one can get to that answer and I might find a way to do it, but it changes it, you know, creatively, like, you know, I, I did not I did another podcast recently and we talked about, you know, being a line producer and what that is. And I gave an example of some elephants. It's a long story. I won't get into that at this particular moment, but you know, it, 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 it's the point where you would say, you know, creatively, maybe it's not 10 elephants, maybe it's three elephants and this, or, you know, creatively as a line producer, when you're not making the decisions, how, you know, the, the overall tone of the show is going to be, you can creatively suggest five or six ideas that will help them get to the point they need to go to, but they're the ones that will have to take that information, decide if they want to use anything or not. And, and if that helps them in the overall arc of what they're, the story that they're trying to tell, does that make a little sense? Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, but I really want to hear about those elephants. What's that about? <laughs> well, it was just an example of a, of a story of what a line producer does. So as opposed to an assistant director, uh, uh, and a unit production manager when in, in the last conversation, and it's a little out of context right now, but basically the definition, you know, I was saying for a line producer is that if a first city gets a script and, uh, and I don't know if you guys know the assistant directors and what they do, I don't know the level of the people listening, but, but if, if this is played later and somebody doesn't know what that is, that's the people that, uh, take the script and they break down and schedule it and put it in an order because as you may or may not know, when you film a project, you don't necessarily do it linearly, meaning from the first scene to the last scene. So it, it's shot out of order for a lot of different reasons and variables, whether it's location or cast or weather or construction or uh, availability of a location in a, well, when you used to be able to go into any public building in the city, mm. uh, you know, and so forth. And so this assistant director takes a script that has no scene numbers on it and puts them in there and breaks them out and inputs them into a program that's made for the industry called movie magic scheduling and they create a schedule and it's a one line schedule that the show, you know, works off of and it's all done in conjunction, you know, with the director and the producers and, 
and, and you come up with a schedule and that's what sets everybody on the, on the long march to, you know, get from point A to point B. So when an AD gets a script and in the scene, it, it's written, it has, you know, six elephants in the scene. An AD puts it on and they know they've scouted the field that they're going to have the elephants in and they're going to shoot that on Tuesday, you know, three weeks from now, right? So the director, the uh, AD uh, previously would have sat down with the director and the director says, yeah, I like six, ele- six elephants. Or the director could have said, I want 10 elephants or whatever it is. And then the AD will come to the producers if they're not in that conversation and say, here's my schedule. Here's when we're doing the elephants. Here's how many elephants, you know, we have. And maybe all the UPM and I and the, our account will look at it and say, you know, elephants are expensive. We can't afford six elephants, but we can get you a three. We can get mm. four. And then, you know, we go back to the director and the director says, it has to be six. We're the guys that have to figure out how we move the money around to get them as six elephants or her six elephants as the case may be. Right. Yeah. And so, so then the AD, you know, we figure out how many elephants it is. And then the AD goes away. And next Tuesday, two weeks from now, whenever I just said it was going to be, he shows up on the set and the elephants are there. But once he leaves that room, I sit there with my little team of people and I say, okay, where are we getting these elephants from? Who's training them? What are the protocols with having them? Who's got the insurance from? How do we feed them? Where do they stay? Who's cleaning up after them? And we have the thousand other variables with every single thing that goes along with having some elephants on your set. And you can take that and expand on that to every single line item of everything on a show. And that's what we're figuring out on the day to day and how much money we have to spend on it and what kind of equipment we need to have with it and who's getting the equipment and where it's coming from and who's making the deals. And, and that's what a line producer does versus an AD who will then needs or she needs and show up on the set and have his or her elephants waiting for them to shoot the scene. Is that making any sense? Am I rambling? I can't tell. No, it makes total sense. And it's interesting for you in particular to be breaking that down because you, you've had all these roles before you've worn all these hats. Yeah. Um, th- started many years ago. We're not going to say exactly when, but you did mention Seinfeld. So I'll just say I started in the, in the 1980s. Uh, yeah. So uh, without dating myself too much. And I was a young kid and I was a very tenacious kid. And I started working in the business when I was 16 years old. And Were you a PA at that time? I got a job as an office PA and uh, I'd show up and, and do just that. And then I turned that into another job and another job and another job. But I, I was a production assistant and a non-union assistant director for about six years until I got into the DJ training program. Uh, I also was an assistant to a lot of different people along the way too. I should say that like writers directors, actors, and other producers. Uh, so in that six year period, I did all those sort of things and learned the business to whatever degree to finally figure out what I actually wanted to do in the business, which is, you know, is hard because how do you know, unless you're on a set or watching people and having the opportunity. And for myself, every set I was on as a PA, uh, and every set I was on as an assistant to one of those kinds of people, I would look at you know, the activity on the set. And I'd say, Oh, grip, grip guys are interesting. They're cool. They're working with their hands, but that's not me. I was, I'm not cut out for that. Or, you know, I'd be in the post-production on the editing side as a PA in the office. I'd see what they're doing there. And I was like, I can't sit in a dark room for 12 hours a day. That's not for me there. And, you know, and you go through this process of the kind of things you like and don't like, which is positive and negative reinforcement. And I got to the, when I was on a set, the one thing appealed to me was that there was one person at the center of this little busy beehive where everybody was going to them, no matter who it was, it was the directors, it was the, you know, producers, it was the actors, it was the, every crew department. And I was like, that seems like an interesting job because those people are people of action. And I always liked that. And that's my sensibility as a, as a Virgo, <laughs> if, if <laughs> thing, or, you know, just my logical, you know, sensibilities. I really, that appealed to me. And that person was the first assistant director and they're the field marshal, if you will, if you want to put it in military terms, and they're the people that are facilitating the former movement of the shooting company. And that's another difference. I'm, I'm going to get, I'm going to digress on a slight little tangent for a second there. Sure. Uh, please raise your hand if you're, if any of this is boring, <laughs> but you know, an AD or an assistant director and the PAs that work for assistant directors, they're taught this kind of mindset to solve their problems as quickly as they can, as fast as they can. And on big budget studio features or television series that are for network television, uh, you know, there's solving problems is a little bit easier sometimes than the non-union independent movies or short films or student films or, you know, the, the projects that don't have, you know, a lot, of, a lot behind it because those other 
types of projects have money to throw it to solve answers. And sometimes that's all it takes is a lot of money and it's a train that's not going to stop. So when you work in the, you know, learning your trade in these, in the non-union world, there's a PA or, or, you know, like I said, on short films or student films, you know, that's where you get to meet, be more creatively involved because you have to come up with the same kind of answers, but you don't have the money behind it. So you, you creatively, it's, it's more difficult. You, you have to really, you know, use your, your mental resources to, to figure it out. And that's a great training period. And something that I, I think a lot of people sometimes lose along the way after they've gotten to a certain point. Uh, now I want to go backwards. So, so that was my little sidetrack a, a digression yeah. about that. But so now ADs are taught this um, idea of of moving very quickly because time is money on a set, and you're leading the set forward to complete your shooting day that you've scheduled. And you know when you, when you're in television, it moves a lot faster than features, or uh, you know everything has its own pace and everything has its own amount of shooting days that it takes. And sometimes with big budget pictures, you can shoot an eighth of a page a day. You know, you've heard the old, you know, stereotype that uh, in Ben-Hur, the script page said they race, you know, and that was the 18 minute scene you saw, you know, that probably took them four, three, four weeks to shoot or whatever it was. You know, I know on uh, Saving Private Ryan, we shot the opening battle sequence that we prepped and, 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 and organized for, for a long time. We shot that over five weeks in Ireland and, uh, you know, for that sequence alone. And then the rest of the movie is a kind of a walk and talk movie for the most part with interjected with little bits of action or, or, you know, poignant moments. And that was one of the very few movies that we shot in linear order, uh, where we did shoot from the first scene to the last scene because the arc of the actors was necessary for Steven to figure out. But, you know, the rest of the movie was only shot over another five or six weeks you know, as the case, as the case was. So you have one sequence that lasted 20 minutes that took five weeks and the rest of the whole entire, you know, couple hours that you saw was another five or six weeks. Anyway. So the idea behind being an assistant director and people on set is to move very fast, uh, or fast enough to let the director get their material with the actors at, at whatever comfortable pace they need, but you have to set that schedule as a unit production manager. And as a line producer, you have to retrain your brain. It's actually almost completely opposite where you have to, instead of say, yeah, let's move, let's move, let's move. Here's how we solve it. You have to say, hold on a second, put on the brakes. What's the question behind the question? And the reason for that is, is because there's, there's, there's ways to solve things that might necessarily not necessarily need to be done quickly that might actually benefit uh, the pace of the show by taking a figuring out what the most efficient, whether it's cost efficiency or efficiency for the sake of the crew or for the material or for safe and safety and health, whatever it is. And you have to be that kind of barrier, uh, to be receptive to, to slowing it down, to figuring out the minutia, uh, of, you know, what's the question behind the question to, to, to figure it out together. I hope I didn't get too off track there. No, not at all. And and you said you were uh, assistant director, but that's not an assistant. That's a kind of a department head role, right? Just to clarify for everybody. Well, okay. There's there's an there's okay. So there's an assistant to a director, and that's like a production assistant that's specifically you know, or an assistant that's someone that's specifically taking care of that person, meaning making sure that their life is working so that they can focus on the set, whether that's picking up their laundry or, you know, dropping off stuff or, you know, getting them a coffee on set or taking notes for them. And I mean, it's most assistants, that's their training ground to become producers for those, those people. So it's, it's, it's a really interesting job because you're learning, you know, one-on-one -on -one with, you know, some pretty interesting people along the way doing that, which is one of the things I did. And, uh, and it's invaluable, that kind of stuff. So that's an assistant to a director. An assistant director is, well, it, it can be a non-union or a director's guild of America, uh, um, position. There are second, second assistant directors, key second assistant directors. Uh, there's also additional second assist assistant directors and first assistant directors. And outside of the director's guild in other countries, there's something called third assistant directors, which is the equivalent of a second, second assistant director. A lot of assistant directors I just mentioned there. And those people are the people that are, uh, that are facilitating the inner workings and, uh, of how a set runs. And the creative end of it is they're directing all the background action. So they're painting with all the people, all the background artists. I don't like to call them extras, 
because it seems superfluous and they're very important to scenes. Uh, they create the believability of the atmosphere of a scene. So I use the word background artist. So they direct all the background artists, all the cars. Like you can pick any movie right now, Tapa, that you've seen. And, the, you know, give me one for an example. If I'm putting you on the spot, then that's okay. You don't have to. Any movie I've seen? I'm um, trying to think of something that might have background actors. How? how uh, Fight Club. Why is that the first thing that came to mind? <laughs> <laughs> that's right club. You, know, you have brad pitt and ed norton in a room fighting and if you didn't have all those other people it wouldn't be believable it'd be it would it, it would be this thing so everything in that movie david fincher oh david fincher is a, a different example because he's very uh macro and micro uh, focused on everything on his on his sets and a lot of directors you know don't but but as a dga person the responsibility of directing the background action falls to the assistant directors. As a matter of fact, the director is not allowed to direct them, strangely enough. It happens, but that's the actual technical rules of the basic agreement mm. on a union set. So in Fight Club, everything that you saw in there that wasn't, you know, uh, Helen Bonham Carter and, and Brad Pitt and Ed Norton and all that was directed by a, a, a great first AD named Mike Tapuzian. I just happen to know. Everyone calls him Spike. Um, and, and all the cars that move and everything that gives that atmosphere is directed by him and his team. So, uh, I, you know, that's a very creative outlet for, for us because that is tangible and what's left on screen or on your television every day. And that was exciting to me too, because I could see my, my work up on screen specifically. And, and, and so that, th th those are assistant directors and they, they run everything. So everything goes through them and nothing moves forward without their permission. Even though, and they, and the great thing about an AD is that they have to know everybody else's job. And I don't mean like they have to know how to do it. They have to know what it takes for them to do their job. So they understand how to quantify time to every bit of action they're asking for. And they're also the people that have to be responsible on set for safety and for keeping everybody, you know, uh, in, in good spirits, if you will. You have to lead by example. And you have to have stamina and endurance, which is something we can talk about also coming up in, in you know, after this little part of this. Yeah. Uh, but there you go for, for, for the difference between, you know, an assistant to somebody and being an assistant director. And, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. And, and it looks like the oldest credit I see for you, just kind of go back again, like you said, um, on IMDb is a DGA trainee on Seinfeld. And I know it was kind of a, you know, like you said, it was kind of a while ago, but. On Seinfeld like crazy. Uh, I'm a big Seinfeld fan. <laughs> I, Obviously. DGA trainee is, is a Directors Guild of America trainee, which is also a program that's run by the Producers Guild too. It's a, a producer's training plan. So it's a joint um, association that trains people to become assistant directors. And when you graduate the program, you can join the, assist, the Directors Guild as an assistant director. And it's been around since the 1960s. And uh, they average anywhere from about 10 to 15 people a year that they accept. And it was originally, uh, and still is, was, uh, was made by the two guilds to help uh, you know, women and, and minorities at the time to get diversity, get into the business, because there wasn't clear avenues to for them to be able to find jobs in the industry and um at the time you know it was predominantly you know white male centric you know directors and assistant directors and unit P unit production managers you know with the, the few odd you know differences but the, the the so the program was set up to, to help people do that and and to help people be able to get in who have never been on a set before don't know anything about the business so it's a wonderful program and it pairs you on shows for 400 days to train under working assistant directors and uh you know if you picked probably in the last 20 years every you know best picture nominee if not the winners they were all done by people that have come out of this program you know, it's pretty amazing. And there's some pretty incredible, amazing people in it. There's a list I even have of, you know, the 500 of us that have uh, probably graduated now through the program. But wow. Get in, I, so, so after being a production assistant and an assistant to, like I said, directors, producers, and actors, uh, I, I got into the DJ and a non-union assistant director. I got in the DJ training program and I started, you know, my 400 days in, in 1993 
and uh, graduated the program in 1995 and was able to join the Directors Guild at that point. Wow. So Seinfeld was one of the shows that I was placed on to learn from those assistant directors and unit production managers. And uh, I did, you know, I would do the background on the shows uh, and, and, you know, on every, well, not every show, but on that particular one, I, I did, I, I, that's what I was doing. What would you say is the most important thing you learned from that program as you were going through it? Okay, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> you have to, you have to learn how to be receptive to criticism and you have to learn how to be a chameleon because you're placed with so many different kinds of people that do things so many different kinds of ways. And most of the time or some of the time, it's not the way you personally would like to do it, but you're not in the position at that moment in your life to, you know, make those decisions. You're the, you have to execute the decisions that are given to you. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, that's a, that's, it's a tough thing to learn because if you're a type A strong personality like myself, you feel like I got this, but in truth, in hindsight, which is always 2020, as they say, you don't have it and you don't know. And I wish I had taken more time to get to know those people that were training me a little deeper because I think I would have gotten more out of the program. I think I got a lot out of the program and I think I did very well with it, but because I had the background and I was one of the few people in the program that had the background of the, all that set experience before, I also had a little bit of an attitude at the time, which, uh, you know, I'm not proud of, uh, but you know, it, you follow the path you're on. And, uh, and so, so, I, I think, you know, being open and is a, is a very big part of, you know, the, you know, that for me. Yeah. Is there any advice you could share with folks who are maybe applying for the program now? Cause it is so competitive. Is it? I, okay. So when I, <laughs> I'm going to take your word for it. I, you know, it's been X amount of years, obviously, since I took the test and got into the program. As a matter of fact, I took the DJ training test. It used to be a test. And I know they don't do the test anymore, but you used to have to go down to like UCLA or USC and there'd be 2,500 people lined up to take like, it was equivalent of like an LSAT or an MSAT. And, uh, you know, you would fill that part out and the people out of the 2,500 people, you know, there's a bell curve or whatever they accepted, you know, I think 150 of those people to the assessment center test, which is, I think where they start with now after you fill out your application, I'm not sure someone can correct me and, and, and speak to it probably better than I could at this point. But, uh, then you go into the, the assessment center. It's like a couple months later and you're, you're putting groups of, you know, 10 people, you know, out of this under, you know, and it's done over three days. And you, you know, you, you, you take at that point, you, you were sitting in a room and they, and there was a moderator in your group. And I think there was someone from the director's guild and someone from the producer's guild and maybe even a psychologist, I want to say something like that, some kind of, you know, uh, m mental health expert. I don't know what, it, what that person was. And they're in the background and the moderator would, would be going over scenarios and questions. And, and as a group, you try and solve them. And I think they were looking to see who was problem solvers and who was the leaders and who were followers and stuff like that. So out of that group of 150 at that time, they accepted 50 of us to the interview portion, which was like a week or two later. And it, you go in a room with the entire board of the Producer Guild DGA Producers Training Plan, you know, that oversees the uh, uh, DJ training, training program. And they would sit and interview you, all these 25 people, and just you at like the head of this huge table uh, for like an hour. And they would ask you questions and talk to you and all this. And, and based on that, they would narrow down those 50 people to their top 10 or 15 people or whatever it was. The year I went in, it was, there were, 13 that started and uh, 11 that graduated or 10 that graduated, something like that. Um, so that, that was how the program, you know, worked back then. Uh, I think it's an online application now and maybe an assessment center test is what they do next. And then the interview. So they don't do that LSAT, MSAT kind of six hour, you know, crazy questions, you know, kind of thing that, that goes on and on. Is that what you had? Did I, what was that question? I think I lost my train of thought. Yeah. We're just looking for maybe, you know, a bit of advice for folks who are applying for it. There's no way to prepare for, you know, by watching movies or reading or, you know, anything for, for this particular thing, because I think it's a lot about, you know, having savvy and, uh, and a little bit of uh, charisma. And I think, you know, I didn't get in the first two times 
and uh, pass the test. And I couldn't figure it out. And the third time that I took that long six hour test, I said to myself, because they had this multiple question, A, B, C, or D, you know, like 400 question part of it towards the end. And it felt like a, a, like a, a psychological test in a way. Like I always sometimes never, you know, this question. And then the question would be repeated in a different way later on. And, you know, I guess they're checking to see if you match up with your, your true, you know, ways. And I didn't get in the first two times. And I'm like, am I just not the right personality? But I said, no, this is always what I wanted to do. So I decided to answer those questions as if I was already a first AD. Mm. And, and that was interesting because that was the year that I got in. And I don't know if that had any part of the components that got me to that place, but, uh, answering questions as if I was a first AD really made it a very clear way to answer everything without thinking it over my head and trying to figure out, is this the way I want to present myself? And, uh, and so that worked for me that year. Don't know. I mean, uh, there's a story of, uh, these two brothers that were, that, that, uh, are ADs, uh, one's a director now, John O. Oliver and his brother, Eric Oliver, terrific ADs. And he's a terrific director. John is a terrific director. And, and, uh, and they both took the training test and they both made it to the interview. And, uh, I think, you know, uh, uh the question to John who went in first was, you know, if we can only take you or your brother, who should we take? And John said, you should take my brother. I feel like I'm going to get in and do this, you know, and, and, you know, he probably needs the extra leg up and, you know, take him. And then they get Eric in there later and they say, if we can only take you or your brother, who should we take? And he says, take me, take me, take me, because he knew that too. And that was their two selves. And they actually took both of them and they both made it through the program. And they're both, like I said, terrific, uh, uh, storied, uh, careers in this business now. But, uh, but yeah, it's really hard to study for, I think you just need to be you and you need to be genuine and sincere and that will come through because sometimes I've found that like book smart people aren't and that aren't as street smart, if you will, or I like to say savvy, um, you know, don't fare as well because you're, it's a, it's a high pressure job where you're dealing one-on-one with, with a lot of people, or mm. one-on-one, one-on hundreds with a lot of people. And you have to always keep your calm sensibility about you. And that's the great, you know, trait and characteristic of an assistant director is one that exudes calmness and, uh, and, uh, leadership, you know, that that's very, um, you know, you don't worry with that person and that's the job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's great advice. Just kind of moving back forward to, to today, you know, as a problem solver, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on how you might solve problems on set today, you know, in the current climate, what do you think that's going to look like going forward? Well, that's funny. Maybe we should get to that in a minute because I think there was a question that I don't, and you correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if I answered because it's almost like I just said I was a PA and then I was a trainee and then all of a sudden I'm here a line producer. I think there's a few steps in between. Yeah, I'm happy. let's walk through it. To bear a little bit more explanation that might help, you know, some of these people. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. I think that's a great idea. So we got I don't so mind we, talking about the current climate. I've got a lot to say about that too, but I I would like to make sure that I Yeah. Answered. Absolutely. And we'll get there. Everybody's talking. You can't not get there. Um no. So exactly. So from DGA tra- from DGA training to second AD, can you walk us through that transition? Sure. So so you go through the program though. I want to step back one more moment and but, you're assigned to all these shows and you know you're sent all over the place. And it's like joining the army. They, they control your life for the 2 years or 2 and a half years that it is where you know you can't go out of town without asking them because there might be an assignment if you're not working or, and you have to be available and that's part of the job. And you have weekend seminars that you have to do that they train you, you know, once or twice a month on a Saturday. So it's a, it's a pretty comprehensive job. And when you're working on a set at the time, you know, in those days and, and still to this day, to whatever degree going forward, I don't know. Um, you know, you'd work 12 to 14 hours a day. And as a trainee, sometimes even more, cause you're there first in and sometimes last out cause you're also the lowest paid uh, AD member on the totem pole, you know, you're not actually in the guild, but you know, you're, you're part of that, that, that team. And so, you know, I, I remember, you know, working 20 hour days and then you get your four hours and you're back at it again, you know, and that's just the the kind of dedication you have to do. And I talk to people in, if you ever look at any of my other seminars or webinars or podcasts that I've done, and, and, and I'm sure Tapa can link them or tell you how to get there to see some of them. I just mentioned that the, 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 the key in this business and, and, and is your reputation. 
And to get a reputation, because uh, there's good ones and there's bad ones, you have to be consistent from the very beginning. And what I mean by that is that you have to give a hundred percent effort, a hundred percent of the time. And that's, what's going to set you apart from everybody else, because there's, there's a lot of other people that want to do exactly what you want to do, whatever that may be. But the one thing that's going to set you apart from them is your work ethic. And there's some people that no matter how successful they are, they still have that, eth- that, that work ethic in that Tom Cruise, for example, he bar none to me, and I've done three movies with him has never uh, failed at being the top of my list of a guy that I want to work with because of his work ethic. He, he gives a, he gives a hundred percent, a hundred percent of the time. He's, he's, that's just what he does. And that's inspiring. It's hard to keep up with him, but it's challenging. And it's a, and it's, it's, it really makes for a, an interesting, you know, great show, you know? So, so your reputation is what you build from the very beginning. And if you, build it with sincerity and being genuine and, and interest. There's no shortcuts, you know, to this, there just isn't that will get you job after job, after job, after job, because people recognize, you know, that in you. And that's what this bills business is built on interpersonal relationships. And here's the little secret. You're not going to get along with everybody Mm -hmm. all the time. It's not going to happen. There's 300 people with different creative ideas and different creative personalities. And, and you're no one, is the person that's going to make it all work all the time with everybody. And if you are, then you're not being true to yourself, you know? So that's okay too, as long as you recognize that. But if you are, you know, if, if you, if you focus on those kind of things and you start there, things will, those magic doors of opportunity will open up. So, okay. So I keep getting off on little tangents and forgive me, Tappa (laughs) back to the, the transition. Yes. Are you enjoying this? You're the only face I can see. So I'm, I'm looking at you like I'm just speaking to you. <laughs> okay. Nobody else has their uh, live video up, but that's okay. Uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> so, so when I graduated from the trainee program, uh, I was invited to join the Director's Guild as a second AD, although you're not hired as a second AD first. You're hired as a second, second, or additional second. And then, you know, you work your days up to learn that. And, uh, part of my work ethic and my hundred percent, hundred percent of the time was to, you know, in the beginning, it's hard to, uh, mold your career. You're just trying to establish your career. So I would take any job that was offered to me in the beginning or any difficult job that nobody else wanted to take, because those kind of things got me invaluable experience. And those were like, what I say, those are arrows in my quiver to be able to draw from. Mm. So I would do shows that took place all in water, or I took shows that were all in the jungles or the desert, you know, at a hundred degrees, or I took shows that was all mechanical effects. And every show that I did, you know, nobody wanted to do these shows because they're miserable, tough, hard shows. And you don't always, you know, get to do the Academy winning best picture, you know, every, every time you go up to bat, you know, half or all of it, I will say is, you know, paying your bills and paying your rent. And it's a job. And I always tell people that the movie business is glamorous until you're in it because, Mm -hmm. you know, you're doing a lot of hard work and there's, like I said, no substitute for that. And you can't get around that. So having all that different varied experience, you know, of these little arrows in your quiver, you can draw from and people start to recognize like, Oh yeah, he's, he can do that. You know, I need the guy who did the car movie because I got this car commercial, you know, whatever it is. And, and, Those are the the things that I was trying to do until I could start molding my career where I could say, Hey, I'm not interested in that. I'm more interested in doing this because it excites me creatively because here comes the creative side again that we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. I'm more interested in doing something that is exciting to me than obviously not exciting to me. Both are the same job, you know, being an AD or being a UPM or being a line producer, but depending on where you are in your career, you have a little more choice of the kind of things that you want to do. And that's okay. Everybody understands that. So I made the transition. I started working on every show. And then slowly when I got my reputation up as a additional second or second, second, and by the way, working as a, for, for your audience that might be production assistants or assistants or people looking to get in the business or even young assistant directors in, in, in the guild or non-union ones, a really great way to endear yourself and get noticed is to take day jobs. And what I mean by that is that on movies and television shows, sometimes they have a lot of background artists. 
or they have a lot of something or a big effect or a big lockup or whatever it is. And they need additional PAs and additional ADs to fill these mandates. You with me, Tapa? Yeah, absolutely. Following you. So, so with, so with that, you're hired on a show for one day, one week, whatever it is. And your job is just to do one thing literally. And all you have to do is do that one thing very well. The rest of the ADs are, you know, that are there on that show have to worry about everything else. And they've brought you in to handle that one thing. And that's part of them doing their job. And that's a great way to look good to someone because you don't have a lot of extraneous stuff to worry about. And you can have a good personality because usually you come in and you're fresh faced and ready to go. Cause you haven't been working on that show for the last 35 days and everyone's beat up and tired. You're fresh. So you've got this great personality. You've got this one job you're going to do really well. And the next time that those ADs have a show, they're like, remember Jason or remember that guy or that girl did such a great job with that. Let's call him in. Maybe they can make him part of our regular staff because people Get, you know, have their little circles that they're part of, but sometimes, you know, the timing doesn't work out and you need to hire people. So if you're a PA or you're an AD and you're asked to do a day or a week on something, let me tell you, that's a great opportunity to be introduced to someone like me and to do a good job. That's all you have to do is focus really hard for that day or that week. I mean, I was an additional second AD on the movie Heat and all I had to do was do the, ba- the background for the bank robbery sequence. And I mean, Whoa. that was, you know, it was me and like two other additional seconds and four other extra PAs in addition to the team that they had. And what was supposed to be a two day shoot went on for like 30 days, but look at what we made some iconic film history. Wow. That, and those guys remembered us. Like the greatest scene of all time. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> so to get back on track, I, I never seem to stay on track. <laughs> so to get back on track. So I, I established myself as an AD, as a second, second AD. And after a while, I was able to move up. There was an opportunity and I was doing features, but there was an opportunity in television to move up as a key second AD on an old series, an older series, not old, uh, called Party of Five. And I met up with a, an AD there. And, and it's funny because that really gave me a taste of the difference between television and movies. Even though I had done both, I hadn't really been an AD primarily on television, just on features. And I remember setting my background the first day on the set and the first AD came up to me, he goes, what are you doing? He says, like, I've set the background. He goes, well, it's all wrong. And I'm like, what's wrong? And he said, he said, they're too far away. And mm. I'm like, what, do you, what do you mean? He says, well, television, you, you want them up as close as you can. Cause I was thinking in movie terms where you have these big wide canvases and palettes, you know, to paint with. And he said, you're never going to see it on the small screen that we're so far away. You know? Mm-hmm. And so I was like, ah, well, it, yeah, I was a quick learner. You know, I, I immediately, you know, was able to reconnoiter and, and set it the correct way. But, you know, being working television is an awesome training ground, even if you want to do features, because you have to do everything that you have to do in features, but you have to do it faster because your shooting periods are, you have for one hour episodic, you know, procedural drama, whatever it is, you have you know, you have eight days to make that show, give or take, depending on the stream of these streaming companies, it's longer, which is 96 hours. And if you have a script that is 55 pages or 50 pages and has 60 scenes in it, you know that you can't shoot 60 scenes that are going to take three hours each because you don't have enough hours. You have 96 hours. Mm. So you know that, I mean, this is going back to me being a line producer. I can say to the writers, you know, Hey, you know, you have eight people in the scene. That means you're going to have to have coverage. And every time you turn the camera around, that's going to be another 15 minutes to half hour of setup or whatever it is. And you, you know, all the takes there and you can't make the schedule. And that's like one idea, you know, one variable. So mm-hmm. you can do it with less people in the scene, or maybe you can do whatever. And I'm getting off track again, but, but you know, these are the things that, you know, you work, the canvases, you, the, 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 the palette you work with, you know, and you have to figure out as yeah. you're getting up further and further in the business. So I, getting back on track. I'm going to get myself back on track. Now. <laughs> so I worked my way up to being a uh, second AD on party of five. And then I started, you know, hooking up with ADs who liked my work ethic. And I moved up until I, I and along the way at this point, by the way, I found a lot of mentors, which is something that I will explain to you later. And I tout as a very important thing in the business. And, um, and I had some mentors and I finally had a, a mentor, uh, a producer, who, uh, with a little encouragement from my wife at the time, and she's still my wife, but at the particular time I was working with him to establish a deeper relationship with this person because we got along. And as an AD, I never really thought about that before this point, because I just associated producers as their own little group and ADs as their group, you know, and that's not the truth. You know, this is what I'm talking about, those interpersonal relationships. So we went out to a few lunches 
and uh, I became friendly with him and he gave me my first opportunities to move up later on. So that's the kind of genesis of the, of the path that I took, mm-hmm. but it was peppered the entire time with a lot of hard work in a lot of really hard, difficult locations, uh, with, a, in a, with a lot of hard circumstances and, uh, you know, over the past, you know, there's no overnight sensation, you know, it's 34 years of, uh, in the trenches, uh, you know, beating myself, uh, up, you know, for the, for the greater good of making a show for, for somebody else's vision. Yeah. Was it a difficult, uh, sorry, difficult transition to make to go from first AD to UPM? Well, I, like I said, I had a mentor, this gentleman named Howard Griffith, who is an amazing producer. He's a TV producer and he has a great background too. He's such a lovely man. He's like a, he's like a father figure to me. One of the few mentors, you know, that's like that, where he, he had been in the business. He's still in the business. He's still producing the Orville currently right now. And, uh, I met up with him on a, on a half hour single camera show for ABC called better off Ted and where he was the unit production manager. He wasn't actually producing that one. Mm. And that's where we met the first season of that and got along. And, and because we got along and, and do that, he, he hired me on a lot of his other shows, but he, I was doing, I remember I was doing a Michael Bay movie in Europe and it was, you know, it's like 20, 16 or something. I can't remember the exact date. Um, and it was transformers five and it was a very difficult show, not because of Michael Bay, but just because it was one of those, it was a $360 million big budget action picture that we shot all over the world. And it requires a lot of, uh, focus and endurance and, uh, you know, with some very interesting creative people. So to, you know, I was, I was at a point where I didn't know if that's the kind of jobs that I wanted to do anymore. And I had one day in London, I called Howard up and uh, I said, you know, I don't know if I'm cut out to do this anymore. I feel like I've, I've hit my glass ceiling and uh, I need to make a change. And he said, great, I'm going to help you make a change. You're going to be my legacy. And I said, well, what do I have to do? And he, and he basically told me, he says, come back when you finish your show. I'm starting a pilot, which I wasn't available to do at the time, but, uh, uh, he said, you'll come do the series as the first AD, the first year. I'll train you to be the UPM. So the second year you'll be the UPM and I'll train you to be the producer. So the third year you'll be the producer. And he's been a stand-up guy and a man of his word and someone that is a very, obviously very dear to my heart and uh, makes you want to work hard for him because he's, he's genuine. And you don't find a lot of those people in this business. So when you do find them, you want to hold on to that. And you want to give them as much as they're giving you because that's the, the synergy of, of those kind of relationships. You know, I think he had me uh, as part of his team because I performed. And I was able to let him know that he didn't have to worry about my end of things. Yeah. A great relief for people above you to know that it's covered below you, you know, or yeah. when it, when you need them. Does that make sense? Yeah. That makes total sense. So, it, yeah. So he, he gave me that opportunity and true to his word. That's exactly what happened. As a matter of fact, they bumped me up to producer the second year by the end of the second year. So it was a little ahead of his schedule. Hmm. And, and, uh, I think I did a well enough job that, uh, Fox, the company that were the studio that we've been working for, uh, actually ended up giving me my own series to line produce, uh, to be the Howard of that series. So wow. that's how my progression went, but wow. once again, the theme of it is hard work all the time. That's not, yeah. I don't have a good time and I don't know how to smile and laugh and, you know, have a little fun with the job, but the work comes first. Yeah. Yeah. If I could put you in that mental role for everybody who's listening right now, um, you know, what advice would you give to your, your 20 year old self or to, you know, folks in that position who want to get where you're at right now? So I think this might take yeah. your question. I'd like to read something that I wrote if that's okay. And I'll set up what this is for, you know, cause this might help people inspire people. That's what I wrote this for. Yeah, please. Four is yours. I think, I think this is a great time to do it. Okay. So I, 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 a few years ago, I was asked to give a keynote address to a short film festival here in Los Angeles. I don't know where everybody is, but I'm in Los Angeles. And uh, it was for the Holly Short Film Festival in Hollywood. And, um, and it, most of the, the keynote was about short films and about directors and all that. But there's a, a section of it, and I have it right here because I think it's important to these lovely several people that are here that it might really be inspiring to you. So I'm going to kind of read it, talk to you about it, and then, and then we can you know, go from there. 
So I'm just going in the middle of it. So I, I said, let's stop for a moment and talk about some do's and don'ts in, and ethics. It's a cliched business. Like it or not, you have to remember that though that it is a business. It's not called show friends, as you've heard, but it doesn't have to be that way. Here are some of the things you can do to make it a better place for yourself and those around you. Okay? Be humble and have empathy. Be nice and be genuine. Support your fellow person. There is room enough for everyone in the business. These contemporaries around you are your allies. This is your network working that you get in real life. Take those small opportunities. Always try to say yes. They always lead to bigger things. Help whenever you can. Contrary to popular belief, it's a lot easier to say yes than it is to say no. That being said, there are times when you should say no. Don't be afraid of that either. Forge creative partnerships wherever you can, all the time. Read a lot. Really read more than just scripts, all the time. Information is power. When you know something, you become valuable to other people. It's a freelance world. I know we're not the types that can sit behind a desk nine to five, but the life you're choosing means you have to always be hustling. You have to believe in yourself more than anyone else believes in you. Try and find a mentor. This can't be taught. I know, Tapa, this is not what you wanted to hear. but <laughs> <laughs> So I guess what I'm really imparting here is that you need to be true to yourself. At some juncture, you will remind someone of themselves at the beginning of their career. There is no honest way to tailor yourself to somebody else while keeping it real. You just need to find the opportunity to be in the company of someone that you respect and have similar traits. Then give them a chance to see themselves in you and your work or your desire to work. Have other pursuits and goals outside of film. Be a renaissance man or woman. Be interested in different things. This will make you a well-rounded person and thus more interesting. Plus, you might find out you actually like other things. Learn to hold a real conversation. Listen to the person you are speaking with. Think about what they are saying. Pauses and silences can be a breath of fresh air in a conversation and can lead to topics and answers in, dis that, in a discussion that wouldn't occur to oneself. Have a sense of humor. Be the easy one to talk to. As a, like if you're a director, or whatever your goal was in this particular instance, they were wanting to all be directors. I said, as a director, you are the leader of people. Charisma will open a door, but only get you so far. People want to follow, follow confident people that instill good sense of morals and values. This can also be done with a very light touch. Here are two important don'ts. Matthew, so far so good. You getting stuff out of this? Okay. You're the, you're the only guy I can see. So I feel like this is me and you one-on-one, -on -one, buddy. <laughs> Here are two important don'ts. First, don't fall in love with your project. It can always be better, always. What starts out as something, if given the chance, evolves into other things that it's supposed to become. I like to call them happy accidents. For example, Good Whittle Hunting started out as an FBI thriller. Put that into your mind. Second, don't be the hardest working person in show business when you don't have to. And what I mean by that is that sometimes it's okay to give yourself a break. Not cut corners per se, but maybe being more efficient will get the same results. No drama in making it easier on yourself. That second uh, thing actually reminds me of a story from one of my favorite films. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's about David Tomlin, and uh, he passed away a, you know, a dozen or more years ago. But when he was alive, he was probably one of the best first assistant directors in the world. Hmm. In fact, he's only one of two ADs that ever got a BAFTA award for being an AD. And which is to say, basically, he was widely respected at the time. Hmm. You would know, like, his films, uh, they were Raiders of the Lost Ark and Star Wars. And he did about 47 other movies that were just as big as that. And uh, I was told this story by Michael Stevenson, uh, uh, who was his second AD on the movie, one of his second ADs in the movie. And he's actually the only other AD to also get a BAFTA award, <laughs> too. Hmm. And Michael was a second AD on Lawrence of Arabia. And The Shining, to, that's two of his many credits. And I worked with Michael on that movie in, in Europe, that Michael Bay movie in Europe I was telling you. To. So at that time in 2016, he was 77 years old, still out there hustling, helping filmmakers out to that day. And he's still doing it right now. I know he's out there doing it. It's in his blood. So, but the story he shared with me was from Gandhi, the movie Gandhi. We all know what that is. Oh, I see another face, two faces. <laughs> and Katie, hi. Okay, cool. <laughs> I, I, Mike, uh, Matthew, I'm not only looking at you now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so from Gandhi, uh, you know, David was the first AD on that film and Sir Richard Attenborough, uh, was the director and they're about to start shooting and there's BB. Uh, they're about to start shooting the funeral scene where they had 300,000 extras. 
That's not a, I'm not saying that wrong. They actually had 94,000 paid extras and 200,000 plus volunteer background artists and extras, right? The company had set up these wired speakers across more than a mile of space so that the actors in the background could hear David and, and Sir Richard could give the direction to everybody. Needless to say, it was a very stressful day. And that morning, Sir Richard went to David as all the people were getting settled in and ready. And, and he explained to David that this was the most important movie in the moment, mo moment in the movie to him. And the people, because the people have lost their leader, they need to know that he's become a martyr, but they're unsure of what's to become of them. And, you know, Sir Richard expounds on this thread to David for a solid 20 minutes, you know, mm. the first AD. Mm. At the end of the talk, he asked David to make sure that they all understand the emphasis and the the, the solemnness of this moment so they can capture it with their, you know, many cameras that they had there that day. Cause they're not going to be able to go back and reshoot anything. I and mean, this is a one day, one take kind of deal. And it's imperative that all the background artists, you know, uh, you know, respond and act accordingly. So David says, he's got it. He goes up on the stage, takes the microphone. And in my terrible English action, <laughs> I'm going to give it right now. says, right, everyone Gandhi's dead and you're all sad. Let's roll, please. <laughs> But that's what I mean. You don't always have to take a long road to get results. And there's Daria. Hello. Okay. So this is, brings me to the two do's and two thematic words. Have patience. First, follow the path that is in front of you. I'll give you a hint. It won't be a straight one. You may not see where it goes and it may not seem like the right direction. However, if you're tenacious, that path will lead you to where you want to go. And amazingly enough, it's the journey that prepares you. Second, always be ready to gain perspective. Two other simple words, gain perspective, get the whole picture. There are several things that, re okay, that, before I go on, gaining perspective will make you a better whatever it is you want to be. So there's a lot of people that jump in and react and, and are, you know, sometimes too proactive, but it's, but, you know, one thing can mean something else. And, and I'll, I'll try and give you uh, uh, an example that's not going to, like, I remember I was on a movie in, in Pittsburgh and, you know, an animal trainer said to me, uh, you know, one day and we're filming in the winter, you know, and all this, I said, Hey, what time is lunch? And I'm just, I'm a second idiot. I'm just walking by and I'm like, uh, 1 PM. And I walk and I was like, wait a minute, they know they have it on the call sheet. Why are they asking me that? Or maybe they wanted to know if we're going to break on time. So I went back to get the question behind the question and get a full rounded picture. And I said, why did you want to know when lunch is? And they're like, well, because if I don't feed the animals by this time, you can't use them on set by this time. And that means I have to lose it. You know, and it was this whole thing that was going to change the whole way we were going to have to shoot that day based on a question that had nothing to do with the question they really wanted to know. And so if I didn't get that perspective, it would have screwed up a half a day's worth of shooting. So mm, yeah. I guess back to my, uh, my, my little writing that I did for you guys. I said, there are several things that require zero talent, but can set you apart from everybody else. This is all gold guys. I hope you, I hope you record this and watch it again or write it down. Yeah. One, being on time, respecting others, people, time, and money. This is, this is number one. This is number one. You'd be surprised how often that doesn't happen. Okay. I myself am a 15 minutes late kind of guy and I had to change that in my life. Okay. <laughs> Two, have strong work ethic. I talked about this before, so I'm not going to get into it again, but I mentioned, the, the, I, I will say something. I mentioned Tom Cruise having the best work ethic in the business. And I'll give you an example. I did, uh, one of the shows I did with him was Mission Impossible 4 in, and we're shooting in Dubai. Mm. And we were, I was on the second unit that was doing the um, uh, dust storm and the building stuff. Oh, yeah. First unit was doing like the Indian uh, party, uh, you know, that he goes into and we we're all shooting this in Dubai. And because of our schedule and because of the way we were shooting it, the first, the second unit, the action unit, we would start at seven in the morning and shoot till five in the evening. And because they were doing these night scenes in the first unit, they would shoot from seven at night until five in the morning. Wow. And Tom likes to do his own stunts, as you probably all have heard and know. And, and that is the truth. And he's, he's one of those guys that just is, can do it all. For sure. And, uh, and, 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 and so here's his ethic. He showed up with us at seven in the morning and shot with us till 5 p.m. And then went to the other set and shot with them from seven at night till five in the morning. Wow. A week and a half straight. And he had physio trainers with him. And he said to me, he said, don't call me to Chris Castaldi, the first lady of our unit. Don't call me unless you need me. But the second you call me, I'll be there because he's a hundred, he's always ready. And he would be worked on. He'd try and get those cat naps in and they would be giving him massage and stuff. But here's a guy who worked almost 24 hours a day for a week and a half straight. And you can't even see it in the movie. <sighs> that's ethic. That's, wow. that's, that's strong work ethic. That's an example. All right. 
Number three, effort. Give 100% of it 100% of the time. Nothing less or don't bother doing it. I've already mentioned that before. Four, body language. You can't hide from yourself. Be true to you because you know, we all understand what that is. Either the rolling of the eyes or whatever it is. You, don't, you, you control your body language if, if you're not going to have the right body language. Mm-hmm. Five, energy. Whether it be the types of shoes you wear, the type of healthy food you eat, or how you stay in shape with exercise, it all matters. This is for a long haul. You have to pace yourself and always have a steady amount of energy. And it's not easy. It's a, it's a, it's a marathon. It's not a little foot race, you know? Yeah. So, and it's something that I had to learn over, over the years. And, uh, you know, you have to figure out what you need to do to make that right for you. Six, attitude. I mean, see everything that I just mentioned and that'll, that'll give that. I don't need to go into detail that seven passion, find things that you're passionate about. Eight being coachable. One of the most important ones is don't be a know-it-all. Everyone will have something to teach you, even if it's negative reinforcement. Does everyone know what I mean by that? Mm. Okay. I see some nods. I feel like we're, even though you're not speaking, I love the interaction, you know, the interaction we're having. Okay. Nine doing extra. And that's a little subtle nod to office space, a movie I happen to like. I'm saying, don't just wear the required 15 pieces of flair. He had 37. Every successful person I've worked with is like Brian, not wearing the flair, but going that extra step. You know what I mean? Yeah. And 10, be prepared, read up and study the project and the people on the project, learn the history, the deeper and more intimately, you know, something, the easier it will be for you to make smart, creative and practical decisions. Give yourself every advantage you can that will set you apart from every other person out there. So that's a little few things that I wrote up before, which I think are very applicable or can be applied to you guys. That was a great list. And just so everybody knows, this is all being recorded and you know, everybody will get a copy if you want to go back and dive back in. Because I, I think that was a lot of great advice you just gave everybody. And like you said, that was gold, Jerry, gold. So um, with that, I, I think it'd be a good time to get into the subscriber portion of the show. Um, where we will take questions from the live virtual audience who you've been looking at this time, but now we'll give them a chance to, to ask their questions of you. Um, for the rest of you, if you'd like to hear the rest of the show, you can subscribe on the Anonymous Production Assistant Patreon page. Just go to patreon.com slash tapana. That's T-A-P-A-N-A.